the best art, and, and this isn't just journalism, this is all kinds of art, it starts with giving that artist the ability to do their best work. And you can't, not everybody, but most of us can't really think straight if we're in this you know, extremely expensive city and we've got all this anxiety over our commute and, you know, we have to march up to that big skyscraper downtown. I think a lot of that environment, it's not only suboptimal, it actually is antithetical to the ability to do good art. Welcome to the Strategic Momentum Podcast, the show where we share tips, stories, and advice from progressive leaders on what it takes to break through that business inertia and propel you and your business forward. I'm your host, Connie Steele. In the world of journalism, connecting to your audience is paramount, yet it's a common struggle that those in the profession face day in and day out. And to do your best work and gain that upward mobility, the right environment is key. However, there are common misconceptions of what that entails. Today's guest, former Forbes bureau chief and now founder of the content strategy, planning, and development company, Fitch Inc., Stefan Fitch chose a different path to finding that momentum and reach his own personal and professional potential. Let's hear his career journey. You know, right now today, I own my own company and I am fundamentally in the writing and editing business. Uh, But this is not where I started. I I actually, for 20 odd years, was a journalist writing in a very traditional environment. I worked at, you know, a community newspaper in Portland, Maine. I worked at, I worked at uh, a newswire in New York City. I I did, uh, um, for many years, uh, was at Forbes magazine for the most part, as a bureau chief uh, in London and later in Chicago, um, and was a sort of mainstay feature writer there. In my current role as head of Fitch Inc., I really help other people write. I help other people tell their stories. You very rarely see my name on a byline anymore. Fundamentally, we regard ourselves as craftspeople who are helping uh, companies, business people, tell their stories, you know, use our skills to help them tell their stories well and, uh, and get their ideas down um, and become real thought leaders. And it's a great pleasure uh, to have gone through the journey and, and ended up here. And I'm glad to have you asking me about it. So what was it that made you pivot from being a bureau chief and obviously having quite a prestigious job to wanting to pursue starting your own business? And being able to tell others' story. It's interesting. A lot of times the biggest decisions in life are made around very small, pragmatic issues. I like to say it was, you know, there was a parking ticket I got in Chicago one year that finally just did me in. I'd run in for a a bag of coffee and uh, thought I'd be in there two minutes and gee whiz, I don't have time to fill in. You know, I don't have time to drop a quarter into the meter. Came back out, had a fifty dollars parking ticket, and puzzled over, you know, what what the heck am I? Where am I going to get the fifty dollars uh, to pay this parking ticket with? And I realized that, you know, journalism is a fabulous world to live in, and uh, and I had a great gig at Forbes. The company treated me really well, gave me a tremendous opportunity. I was uh, I was there for twelve years. Um, really felt like I was part of the Forbes family, but you know, I'm also at that point in my life. This is in uh, in 2010. You know, I had a new, well, relatively young new daughter and was starting to ask questions like, where, you know, where is she going to go to school? How am I going to get out of this apartment in this relatively rough, you know, sort of hit part of town and into something that's more family friendly? And, you know, these kinds of ideas that started creeping into my mind, you know, we survived the financial crisis and everything, but, um, and I'd certainly held on to my job. But, but fundamentally, I was realizing like, you know, this terrific journalism gig I had this career wasn't doing everything it needed uh, to do to support my family. Um, And I was really looking at, you know, if I wanted to continue moving up, I would need to go to New York city. I'd need to really become one of the editors of the magazine so on and so forth. I I started asking myself, you know, are there better choices at the same time? You know, the media was going digital. Um, You know, the, the days when most of us get our news by picking up a newspaper or grabbing a magazine off the newsstands or just, um, getting one in the, you know, getting something we subscribe to in, in the mail. Um, you know, we're really moving to, you know, digital uh, reading on our 
on our smartphones, reading on our laptops. You know, that had been going on for a while, but the forces were so strong and they were taking us in surprising new directions. I like to say that we went from a world where, you know, New York Times, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, those were America's newspapers to really Facebook was America's newspaper. Um, it, it wasn't the New York Times.com. It wasn't USA Today.com. Um, that people were really getting to their content and entirely surprising new channels, exciting new new channels. If you if you took a sunny view of it, the days when Forbes was a magazine that served a million people, relatively wealthy Americans, you know, who had to, took a business minded uh, sort of approach to life and were saw most of of uh, the activities in the world through that lens. You know, those readers were moving to Forbes.com. Sure, that that was great. But they were also seeing a lot more of that content on their social media uh, feeds. They were, you know, seeing it on Twitter and so on. The ecosystem was changing so much. And I realized, you know what? There are kind of two things happening here. One is I don't want to move. You know, I need to make more money. I need to do a better job supporting my family. I need to be able to pay this darn parking ticket. Um, But I also don't, I don't know if I want to move to New York. Meanwhile, there's something really big happening in the media here. and Things are really changing. I'm not sure that just being, you know, a hotshot bureau chief is going to be enough. And do I want to fight that or do I want to participate in this change and maybe start a company that is suited to, you know, assist with benefit from the digital media revolution and and potentially that that could play out. It may not, this may not be a two year process. It may be 30 years of change. Um, and I, I realized like that latter opportunity, let's participate in that, recognize that I've had a great run as a journalist, but it's really time to do something new, um, do something bold and scary and risky. No offense to New York City, which I where I lived in, and uh, loved for five years, but I just don't want to move back to New York. <laughs> I, just, like, <laughs> I just don't want to do that. I don't want to go. I don't want to go back to New York and, and, and work out of a skyscraper and and um, and fight with midtown rush hour traffic every day. I, I, I'd like somehow, if I could, to be able to do my very best work uh, from home, from offices in places that I, I know are good for my daughter and wife as well. Stefan inherently knew he wasn't leading the most authentic life he could. And that was critical for him to do his best work as a journalist and as a storyteller. In order to connect to his audience, he had to ensure he connected to himself and his family. And as Stefan will tell us, the best art happens when artists are somewhere they know where they can do their best work and be authentic versions of themselves. I was the classic, you know, sort of an investigative, I guess you'd probably say like, you know, you're a grumpy reporter, you know, I mean, when I was at Forbes Um, and, and the world needs grumpy reporters. We really do. Um, you know, we, the world needs a skeptical media. Um, if you spend time around journalists, uh, you, you know that they're, they're kind of fundamentally, they're critical people. And, and, you know, I certainly had spent 20 years, you know, sort of doing that, but I really started asking myself, can I make the leap to helping other people? And that, that might involve, you know, getting some more positive, positive vibes going, you know, uh, helping people tell their story, you know, try to, you know, you're not here to just pick apart, uh, certainly not you're here to pick apart your clients. They may want, they, they may want to ask you for constructive criticism, but, but you're fundamentally kind of in a different posture here. And one of the things I realized, not only was I going to be capable of that, but it really was more authentically who I felt I was. And I, had, you know, you don't necessarily have a choice to be exactly who you are when you're 22 years old and you're just out of college, you need to go make a page. Right? You got to go give the world what it wants. But I was reaching a point in my life where I was like, what do I want? Um, do I want to go back to New York and be that, that grumpy editor, you know, after spending 20 years as a grumpy writer, or do I want to like, take it in a different direction that would, would feel different. And I, I realized like, not only was it something I could do, but something that really, uh, ultimately, that's who I am. I am more of a positive person. People sort of used to marvel. In fact, I had my friends and and my wife, you know, marvel over like, you know, for a guy who on the weekends is as cheery and positive as you are, you know, it's really odd that you're a 
that you're an investigative journalist and a, and a, and a kind of the type of cat who, who gets up in the morning intending to bring billionaires to their knees. You know, it just, it, it just, people had kind of noted it in the past and it wasn't really until I started thinking, thinking a little more creatively about my own career that I realized like, you know, that this, this is ultimately more, it's more authentic to who I am. And it's been one of the most gratifying sides of being here at Fitch Inc. Where I am, I am actually, you know, on, being an entrepreneur requires you to be positive. It requires you to be optimistic. And that actually feels really natural to me. It's one of the great, great joys that I've had since, since coming here is, is being able to actually take that positive energy and put it to work as I develop my business. And it sounds like certainly you put yourself in a more positive, optimistic, and fulfilling personal environment as you move from Chicago to uh, moving out west because you're now in Arizona, nice and sunny and close to the mountains and being able to do the things that you want to do. Absolutely. You know, it, and it, it's actually ended up really helping with, you know, because again, we what we are usually doing for our clients is is it looks, it has all of the same ingredients as good journalism. And one of the things I realized, and it's really been confirmed since coming over here, is that, you know, good journalism, you know, there's, there's a real art to it where it does not need a lot of overhead to, to really operate well. You know, the, the best art, and, and this isn't just journalism, this is all kinds of art, it starts with giving that artist the ability to do their best work. And you can't, not everybody, but most of us can't really think straight if we're in this you know, extremely expensive city and we've got all this anxiety over our commute and, you know, we have to march up to that big skyscraper downtown. I think a lot of that environment, it's not only suboptimal, it actually is antithetical to the ability to do good art. See, I just come back from a week in New York, very exciting week, had a great, great time was a wonderful, a wonderful host and everything. But I mean, I, I, I was reminded again of, of how challenging, you know, the, the, the rush hour commute in uh, from Jersey, you know, the, the, the trains that are cheek to jowl, the march through the street, the, the noise, the, it, it's an hour and a half to get to the office. And when you get there, you're tired, you know, you're actually tired and and you know you're you've got your business cashies on and you know you're not really at that moment you're you're ready to do work you're ready to do work but you've been battle you've already done battle all the way in i I would think almost almost no artist would ask for that kind of beginning to their day but would it matter yes yes a few a few people you know uh theater critics (laughs) (laughs) the angry theater critic but I really, I don't think that that human experience leads to a good outcome for the artist. It doesn't lead to a good outcome for the writer. I think what I like to say is my commute is however long it takes for me to flip my laptop open. It's about, it's about having your mind clear. It's got more of a yoga vibe to it. You know, it's like you want to feel safe. You want to feel mellow, calm, and you want to be able to really think about the ideas so yeah, I, I, I do believe one recognizing who are you. Let's just admit it, man. You or, or you know you you are a quiet artist. You know, start with that. How could you reorder your work life to really allow that side to come out the best and really allow that creativity to come? Sure. You're going to have to get back and see your client. Your client's based in New York or Connecticut or, or, or suburban Los Angeles, wherever it is. Yeah, there are times when it's important to go and get their vibe and, and kind of see what they're doing and, and appreciate it. And, and, but, you know, then when you take it back to the studio, you know, you need to be able to quiet things down and kind of listen to the little, little voices inside your own head. Finding that safe, comfortable place for ideas to thrive is just one aspect that has benefited Stefan and his team. But another unintended benefit, and now asset as he will share, is the fact that they are small and agile, and that enables them to have a more intimate relationship with their client and ultimately their client's customer. Tell me about the way your firm operates, because obviously you're small, you're virtual, and I'm assuming as such, you tend to be quite 
agile and flexible and adaptable, which may be why companies like Google and others are attracted to you. And why that's also, I think, important and able to really stimulate the kind of the creative and compelling work that you do. That was one of the biggest surprises. I thought, you know what? You know, I, I when I started the firm, I said I'd love to be the I want to build ultimately the kind of firm that a, a Google or a GE or an Accenture would love to work with. But you know, I'm being realistic. I thought, you know, we're probably never going to have the opportunity to work with these big outfits because they're going to want, you know, they really do not relate very well to the smaller shop. I was completely wrong, wonderfully wrong. Big firms, whether they are looking for, I really think this applies in not only in communications but uh, and and marketing, but it applies in other spaces as well. You know, design, and engineering, and things like that. I think they are thrilled to find these smaller firms that are agile and virtual because they recognize, you know, we're this giant organization. Um, Everything here is, you know, done by teams of 10. And they are thrilled to be able to say, here's this really small agile firm where you can, you can get like the top guy or the top couple of guys or gals and just get them in there. And they'll, they'll honestly tell you, you know, here's what we think you should do. I think they find it incredibly refreshing that they're able to work with a group of folks who can be hyper responsive to their needs. You know, um, I mean, a client like a Google or, or a GE um, could call us tomorrow and say, we want to take things in a totally different direction. And they know that would be like, great, tell us. And, or, or they might say, oh, we didn't even know the direction. Can you tell us which direction we could? Great. We'll sit down and let's, let's, we'll cook up five ideas for you here in the next couple of days and we'll have something to you on Friday afternoon. I mean, that I think is enormous part of the appeal here. It's a little bit like uh, if you and I uh, were like, hey, I, I, want, I want some life advice and I need to go to the guru on the mountaintop. You know, part of the appeal is he's on the mountaintop. He's living up there in a cave and, and he's, he's away from all the noise and, and, and chit chat and the sort of annoyance that we deal with every day and is able to look at us from a completely outsider's perspective. I, I know for a fact that GE said to us on day one, one of the things we really need you guys to do is we need you to not like, we love the fact that you're not stuck inside the world of GE, that you really fundamentally every day we need you guys to show us that outsider's perspective. What I take away from that, it sounds like because of the environment that you've created, where you've obviously wanted to have that authenticity and connection for yourself personally, as well as for your employees, in essence, what you've been able to do is create a circumstance where you can also ensure an intimacy with your client and also as such with their end customer. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Intimacy is something that is lacking throughout the business world, right? Well, for generations, really, you know, you and I, we're not, we're not total noobs at this, right? We, you, you're watching TV. Most, most communications occur through the mass media. Um, and it really wasn't. And, and I think in a lot of ways, it's, we're still learning to, to accept the digital world does allow for a much more intimate form of communication. That's had some really important kind of scary effects. You know, it, it's uh, when we talk about Facebook has become America's newspaper, you know, and, and, and maybe Facebook is losing a little uh, of that now. And maybe, I don't know, maybe Twitter is America's newspaper now. But the main thing is that most of these digital media allow very one, one-on-one messaging, um, one-on-one storytelling. In the old days, uh, um, Forbes, we wrote our, our articles with this idea that, you know, there's a million people will be reading this tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing. Well, in the new Forbes.com, the audience is 70 million, right? So it sounds like a mass media, but it's actually not. It's, you know, most articles at Forbes, you know, are read by, some of them are read by, you know, three, four or 500 people who really are interested in this, in the topic, basically 70 million people total, but it's often 
you know, it's it's 70, 100, 1,000 audiences of that are much smaller, you know, um, and boy, if you're writing, if you're writing, sometimes we, we have often been hired to write an email. Hey, we've got an absolutely mission critical email. It's going out to about 10 people. <laughs> you know, we <laughs> really need you to understand these 10 people and then help us write this email because it's going to count. This thing is potentially worth $4 million. You know, this is where, and, and yeah, you know, um, I've had, I had a, we've had CEOs say, I've got 200 employees. I need you to help me communicate an idea to them to, to have that kind of intimate communication. You know, this is, this is kind of a new skill. It's been one of the most exciting things. This is something I never thought uh, that I never got a chance to do as, as a journalist. Again, I was always writing for, you know, what I imagined as an audience of a million people. That's the number of people who used to, or still, I guess, uh, read Forbes magazine, the print edition that's changing. That's all going away. Um, we're going to be moving a lot more towards these, these much more personal, intimate communications, sometimes for audiences of two, three, four people. So this macro trend of personalization and customization in communication seems to certainly have mirrored your life and career journey. Yeah, because it was all about recognizing the power of the small, um, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a pretty big media company to, to start something really small. And I'm leaving at that time, like Chicago. Now, I, obviously, I live in Scottsdale. I'm leaving the big office to work in a small office, like the one I'm speaking to you from now. The result, oddly, has been, I think, a much grander life for myself. But also, I think I've really, I've been able to do things for clients that I never imagined I'd have an opportunity to work on, you know, that just tell those stories, practice my craft. It's, it's been fantastic. I, I, I am very grateful for having taken the risk. Taking that leap of faith from the corporate world to start his business was a risk that ultimately paid off for Stefan. Outside of a big city, he's found the freedom and agility to pursue opportunities that have led to the career momentum he was seeking. And this is the mentality he's used to build his company. To him, it's most important that his team members are where they feel most comfortable. And that is translated to a geographically distributed workforce. But as Stefan will go on to tell us, though most journalists are already working remotely, there are some misconceptions around working outside industry hotspots. So what's interesting, you said that you're interested in doing your very best work from home or, or wherever you feel would be best for your daughter. So let's contrast that to your corporate life and the dynamics of not potentially being able to work from home and needing to go into an office. How have some of those dynamics and maybe others impacted journalism professionals like you from potentially reaching you know, their own, let's say, creative potential? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because many of your listeners are probably not aware that huge amounts of journalism are done by people that you know, who don't work in New York City or in Washington, D.C. Or, um, or even Chicago. They're done by, you know, sort of reporters out in the field, just like you look on TV and you see those war correspondents, you know, living in faraway countries, climbing around foxholes, looking a little silly with, uh, with their battle helmets on. And even in the world of business journalism, enormous amounts of it are done by people working in bureaus, uh, stringers, freelancers, that kind of thing. And, you know, very fine journalists often will work from remote places because their work is really taking place in their minds and, you know, on their, on their desktop computers, on their, on their laptops, sometimes even on their smartphones. So to some extent, journalists are kind of used to working from, you know, remote spots, maybe working from home offices, you know, journalism is not a place to become a billionaire, but that is one of the, the luxuries of being, uh, you know, sort of a, a, an advanced senior level journalist as you'll often uh, work, you'll often be asked to work from remote places, and, and it's it's not a burden. It's actually you know part of what we love about the job. And and it was I realized that that if I were going to leave Forbes magazine and start this new company that I dubbed Fitch Inc., whose intent was to help uh, companies and business people and investing luminaries and entrepreneurs tell their tales, um, if it was going to you know, help those folks do thought leadership. 
you know, we didn't need. Um, and in fact, we probably sh- we probably should avoid having, you know, a central office um, in in any city or even uh, mid-sized town. It was it was going to be urgent to spend the money where it mattered, um, which is on the creative talent and that enormous numbers of highly skilled writers, editors, reporters, researchers, designers, copy, you know, enormous numbers of them were already, um, you know, people in mid-career, people that had, you know, talents, you know, that would take 5, 10, 15 years to develop. A lot of those people are already kind of working from home offices. And I realized, you know what, this company, you know, just like I, I had that reflex that I would like to avoid if I can working in a big office in any downtown, uh, particularly New York City. I, I realized a lot of other people had that same reflex. And if I could create a company that said, hey, listen, we want you to do your very best work and we would like you. If, if, if this works for you, we would really like you to be able to do that from home or from, you know, some people do like to work from, you know, coffee shops or we works or wherever, but, but really leave that to them. Where do you want to do your best work? It doesn't make a difference to us. All we ask is that you bring your, your best creativity to, you, to the job. And, and that's where I started. And, and that's still how we run the company today. Well, what are the misconceptions or misaligned expectations that you see in the journalism business, knowing that you mentioned a lot of you are already predisposed to working remotely, but yet it seems like, you know, in order to have potentially moved up, you would have to be co-located in these major bureaus and be in New York City. I I think it is actually true for some, some people on certain career tracks that, you know, whether you're working in journalism or public relations or other sort of other big important parts of the, of the media ecosystem, there are, there are times when, you know, look, it's, it's, I have to be in New York. I have to be near my, my, uh, my sources on wall street or whatever, but that is not the only way. And, it, and, and I think that, you know, right from the day that I got that parking ticket, I started saying, is there just another way to see all this? Um, and, and I had to ask myself what my own misconceptions were, you know, do you really just have to be on a track to end up, you know, uh, uh, working in an editor's office back in New York City. Um, do you have to stay at a magazine to be able to do good journalism? I think that's, those are, I realized as I started thinking about it, one misconception, misconception was that you have to be a classic, you know, journalist to do journalism. You, you have to be working at a magazine, newspaper, or, or, or a, on a television network to be able to good, do ju- good journalism. That's not true. Um, you know, I would argue that every very good Wall Street analyst, for example, um, that is uh, following different kinds of companies, they're really fundamentally, what are they doing? They're reporting and writing about it. And they're, they're, they're fundamentally telling sophisticated investors inf- you know, cr- mission critical information that they're going to need to be able to do their jobs well um, and make choices about stocks. Um, I would argue that you know, every blogger, if there are any bloggers listening, they would, I, I would hope they would agree readily with this. It's like every blogger that whether you're writing about stocks all the way to raising chickens in your backyard it, um, to, to just maybe writing about video games, those people are all doing essential work. They're, they're offering the world, they're offering a key audience that really cares information and perhaps offering it in a way that's entertaining and enlightening. Um, that they they will need to make decisions that day and, and the following day. You know, which video game should I buy? Which backyard chicken should I uh, should I? Which breed is the best for me? What what stock should I own? And so, journalism happens in a lot of places that don't look like uh, newspapers, magazines, and television stations. And the other thing is, and that that was a, a core insight. I could I could go out and help my clients. Back then, of course, I had none. Now we have plenty. We could fundamentally do all the same things that you'd want to do as a journalist, which is one, report, you know, find stuff out, right? Two, think critically about what you've found out, you know, and then three, assemble that and analyze it and write about it in a way that can be powerful for your audience, for people that you think care about the idea that you brought them. Or this is important for us. They'll just care more about what you have to say um, and get have a good impression of you. And that is a wonderful thing. The fact that you can do what, what really amounts to journalism, the fact that you can do it in, a, in a, something that isn't a newsroom, in a context that's a little different, and still fundamentally you're still informing the public and sharing ideas and, and making the world a smarter place. And that's kind of, a kind of 
it was eye opening to me and a great relief because I realized like, you know what, this new digital media economy is maybe going to make it harder for me to pay this parking bill. It's going to make it, it's going to make it easier for me to continue to practice my craft. Um, and so stuck with it. And so it sounds like by realizing that there's a different way, more progressive way to be able to still capitalize on being a great journalist, it sounds like you're able to still leverage that you know, creative tension that is critical to being a great journalist. But maybe, and you could tell me otherwise, that a misperception, maybe that that creative tension really happens by being centrally located in some of these bureaus or within a very specific the magazine or newspaper type of environment and being associated and working for these types of organizations. If you are, you're, you're a creative writer, um, whether you're writing for advertising or for journalism or you're writing book, um, all these different forms of, yeah, you know, you put that person, you know, in a hot box in New York city, you know, get them at the writer's table and, you know, everybody's spitballing and it's the whole, you know, the classic idea of how, of how, uh, great ideas are created. You know, let's let's get everybody in this in this super uh, super sexy sort of uh, environment. You know, whether it's the famed you know Bloomberg headquarters or the New York Times headquarters uh, in in New York, or like that you know terrific you know PR firm or advertising firm. There is that that is a an environment where you can get good ideas, um, but it's not the only one. I, I genuinely believe. Uh, a lot of the very best ideas to, to cite Nicholson Baker, you know, you, really big thoughts, you know, they kind of need to be in, in a safe space, maybe like put them in, you know, partially in, in the shade out in the woods, you know, if you will, the brilliance of a journalist can come alive in quieter spaces. I'm living where I feel right. And I'm, I feel safe here in my office and I, I, I can, I can turn the phones off and just have a little quiet and really think. And yeah, a lot of the best work these days, a lot of the best articles, a lot of the best um, thought leadership is not being done by professional journalists, um, although they're certainly still at it. But a lot of the most compelling stuff is being written by practitioners. The best business writing is often coming from, you know, people who have invested in this, that, or the other, and they are telling you about their experiences. Do the thing, in other words, that uh, in, in our case, a lot of our clients, you know, they're, they're running giant companies that get things pulling them in 20 different directions. They don't have, they don't have that nice, quiet stretch of, of hours where they can go, you know, I need to write this thousand word essay. I need to write this op-ed. I need to write this white paper, this speech. That, that kind of um, work, it takes quiet and it takes a sense of safety. I, I like to say, even though we're not physically, uh, m- my colleagues and I, we don't physically all work in one room. You know, we are there for each other. Um, you kind of want to have a sense that, you know, hey, if I'm, if I'm not having, if this isn't working, I can, get, I can get somebody else on the phone, somebody else on the team on the phone. And even if they may be half a world away, I, I get this terrific writer in Barcelona. And, you know, he and I will call each other and share ideas. And I call my friends and, you know, my editors in Dallas or L.A. or, or San Francisco. And, you know, at that moment, it's just like being in the office with them. And the great thing is we all were able to raise our families, you know, um, for the person who really loves living in the city. You know, we have some of our editors do live in, in more of an urban environment. Hey, that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people actually feel safer, um, you know, living in, in the east on the east side of Manhattan than they would you know, out in the sort of verdant, the verdant uh, San Francisco Bay, you know, Marin County, whatever, you know, that's, that's great. It's just, I want my people to find the environment where they can do their best work. Um, and, and um, if they love the give and take of, of the writer's room, you know, we try to create that for them digitally. Um, if, if they don't, we can give them the peace and quiet they need. The main thing is I want them to do their best work for our clients who really are like depending on us to do that hard, sad kind of dreary process <laughs> of writing you know we say writing is relatively simple you you take your arms you wrap them around your knees you turn the lights off and you cry basically softly into your lap <laughs> you know you just sit there and do the lonely work 
because that's really what it takes. It takes seven, eight hours of just quiet and concentration. I try to make that possible for our people so that my clients can get on and go out and sell jet engines or re, re, you know, recreate the digital world, whatever their, whatever their business is. As writers, Stefan's team works best when they're in tune not only with their environment, but the topics they have to cover. This makes for better storytelling, more creativity, and a greater understanding of how to engage the audience in the subject. Because at the end of the day, their goal just like many other organizations, is to create a genuine connection to their target audience. For me, what I took away is all around this sense of connection. And again, that safe environment you talked about, but you know, the sense of connection that you can get to not just your peers in this day and age in a virtual environment, but you know, a connection to the place that you're at and how it seems that that is also a critical facet to being able to get the best work out of your team or or personally, that sense of creativity needs to happen when you can feel that connection with whatever topic you have to write about. I'm so glad you asked about that because really that is ultimately what our clients are often asking us to do that they they are sort of too deep into it to do themselves they are saying to us hey here's the audience that we want to reach we want our audience to think this about us you know it, maybe it's as simple as um uh, take, take take general electric if you will for a moment uh, general Electric is like you know, the G is saying, we sell jet engines, we sell uh, very advanced medical technology, we sell, uh, you know, highly advanced energy systems. How do we reach this audience of engineers, technologists, people that are in some position to design, you know, come up with new designs for energy plants or for airplanes or whatever it is that we want them to know that, you know, we're this, we want to remind them that we're a source of great engineering in, you know, innovation, et cetera, et cetera. They want us to dream up ways for them to really connect with that audience and really make them feel that idea. It's just one example. Um, and and in, in that case, um, we came up with this thing, GE Reports, which is um, something that GE was, it was, it started in on before we just showed up, but we've uh, become a major driving force thanks to some people inside G sort of really believe in the idea, which is where we are telling their audience of, you know, this is a hundred to 200,000 uh, people a month, their stories about different kinds of amazing projects that they've worked on. A lot of times G is not this, the, the sort of most important hero of that tale. They're just involved. And it's, it's, you know, Hey, here's the most innovative new energy project in Europe. You know, here's how it works. It's really somebody else's idea. They're, they've used some GE gear. Uh, there's a particular thing I happen, happen to have in mind at this moment is there's a wonderful energy project they did in, I believe, Switzerland, where they uh, were using mountain lakes as a giant battery, basically. I mean, uh, what they call a grid-level battery, right? So in the, middle of, in the middle of the night when energy is super cheap, they were able to charge this battery up by using these two mountain lakes, by moving water from a lower lake to a higher lake. And then during the day, they could drain that battery down. It's just one tiny example of, you know, the ultimate goal of that story is to really connect to that audience. Similarly here, that's what I, when I talk about writing being that kind of lonely process of closing the doors, turning the lights off, and just, you know, sort of weeping into your lap, it's, it's really the idea of saying, how do you deeply connect to this idea that you're trying to, you know, how to, you, you've got a client, you know what they're trying to do with their audience. You know, they've asked you to come up with some thought leadership that will help them achieve what they're doing. How, how do you clear your head of all the different problems, all the noise of, of uh, modern life and say like, I need a story that will really sew these two ideas together. You know, that, that audience that my client wants to reach using a story that will appeal to them at a very primal human level. What are the key tenets to being able to tell that story that truly connects with people that is authentic, you know, from start to finish? What would you say? I think it starts with 
uncertainty, right? I mean, you have to have when a lot of times our clients, they know what they're talking about, right? They're like, I want to show this audience how wise I am. And I, and I always say, that's, that's a good thing. That's a, that does not hurt you, but I would rather let's go to where you feel uncomfortable. Do you have questions? Learn how to ask a good question. And that is because after all your audience, if you want to teach them something, the very beginning of teaching starts with recognizing that your audience doesn't know something. Well, the best way to connect with your audience is to be like them. So find something you don't know everything about, but you're interested in. All right. Ask a good question. Let us go find some answers. They should not all come from you. And then once you found something out that's pretty cool that you want to share, you know, hey, you know, I had a question about, you know, I have this really thing that's always kind of bothered me and I wanted to know more about it. And so I started asking around, here's what I found out and here's why it matters. I, I think that is the best way to build trust. It's, I think most of us have one point or another have heard it expressed in some form, like the best way to make a good impression on somebody is to ask them for advice. Right. You know, I, mean, that's why, that's why like uh, a lot of salespeople, you know, are terrific at this. They, they love to come and ask you about your day and they start asking you about what you're doing and ask you about why you're doing it that way. And suddenly you realize you really enjoying talking to this person. And all of a sudden you're putting a new roof on your house because <laughs> 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 they're a roofing salesman or, or whatever. I think, I think that a lot of storytelling does begin with, with this I mean, when you think about it, a mystery is really nothing more than a question asked and ultimately answered. And think of how many of us, all, all of our favorite movies and books are often, you know, they're thrillers, they're mysteries, that kind of thing. I think that is, is a, you know, at the, at the heart of every good story. Stefan's realization of needing to live a more authentic life personally and professionally helped him break through the inertia that commonly stifles others in his field. But finding and committing to working in an alternative way isn't always so easy for everyone. For many, it's difficult to get unstuck from a traditional working lifestyle and making the adjustment to working outside of a big office. So what does it take to break through? So what do you think is driving these misconceptions or challenges where folks have been stuck and doing the same thing they've been doing? So they've been in these big cities, going to these big offices, dreading that commute and having to work in maybe a more confined environment versus shifting to you know what you've created for yourself and where many people are also moving towards a, a more remote type of working environment that gives them the flexibility and, and the freedom that they might be looking for. Many, many, many of us in the communications business are stuck inside the idea. It's it's reinforced every time you turn on your evening newscast or you see a movie about about the, the busy professional working life. We're really stuck on this idea that if you know if you're fighting with traffic and headed to a big office, it must be because you're part of you know doing something really important. That if you're not doing that, um, then you can't possibly be doing anything important. Right. You know, from a young age, you know, the countryside is where farmers work. Um, if you are farming, it's important to be at the farm. And if you are doing if you're a lawyer or if you are a an advertising salesman or if you are a, a magazine publisher or a public relations executive, all those things, you should be in a city. You need to be riding a subway or you need to be battling through, you need to be driving south on the 405, whatever it is. It's, that is, you have to let that idea go. You have to decide, like, I do not need to play according to the images and assumptions that I have been living with for a long time. There's some truth to like early in your career, you know, you got to go to where the, you got to work for larger institutions, you know, you got to find a big enough company to have a mailroom in order to get a, a job in the mailroom. Um, I will tell you right now, Fitch Inc., we don't, we, we open our own mail. If, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's like, 
you know, yes, big companies tend to be in big cities. There's a, a case to be made that everybody should live in a city for a little while early in their career. But if 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 a listen, if I were a listener to this podcast and I was like, man, I am really, I, I'm I'm ready for something new. I'm a public relations person. I've been working for an agency for a long time. I kind of make the dreary commute into the office. I work with a bunch of people I like, but I feel like I'm ready for something different. And I'd like to go out on my own. One of the very important things that that you need to do is let go of this idea that, well, I will have to get an office. I will. I remember talking to a guy I love, actually, is still a good friend of mine. Uh, he was he was frustrated. He was in the mid to upper level management at a public relations firm, and he wanted to start his own firm. And he said, you know, the problem is I don't believe I could start a firm without $20 million. And I mean, this was a serious answer. He really said, in order to start the kind of firm I would want to have, I would need $20 million of seed funding. And he just could not imagine starting a firm with without, you know, he needed an office, going to need an office downtown, uh, you know, going to need to build out a, a pretty sizable staff on and on in order to get the kind of clients I want. You know, I'll, I, I need to project, I need to project a certain image. You know what? He might, he probably was right for the kind of firm, but the question becomes, well, why does it have to be that kind of firm? Start with, who am I? Um, do I, would I really like to be working closer to home? Do I want to have a real relationship with my wife or my husband and my children and my cats or whatever? Okay. Yes, I would. Let's just set aside all other assumptions. Yeah. I would like to have a real relationship. I'd like to feel closer to home. I would like to have a shorter commute or maybe no commute. Start with that. Then start with what do I want to be doing with my time? You know, if you're in public relations or communications or journalism, wherever, whatever space you're in, if you happen to be in the communications game, just say, what do I fundamentally want to be doing all day? And then I think it's pretty like, start with those two things are important. Everything else needs to be thrown to the side. You may discover, you know what? I could be doing this in my garage. Um, you know, I could be, you know, maybe I'll be working on smaller projects, but small is not always bad. Small can be very lucrative, you know? And, and it's like, you know, I'm very, th I'm thrilled that, that we have General Electric as a, as a client and, and, and other big firms, you know, the Accentures and then Heineken and on and on as clients at Google. I'm thrilled to have those big names. That's wonderful. But, you know, we do really wonderful creative work for small clients that, you know, most of, of the listeners have never heard of. And I'm really proud of that. And I really hope that those firms keep growing and that we can take some uh, pride in having helped. Once you kind of let go of this, it's only important if it happens in a skyscraper. It's only important if it happens in a big city. It's only, it's only productive if, if it's a struggle and a strain and feels uh, like, like, a real, um, it, it feels like I'm outside myself. Um, that's the only time that it's good. No, you know, you can do something that really feels right to you, that really is leveraging off what you love, and you're doing it in a place that you enjoy, where you enjoy living. You know, you might find yourself in Bend, Oregon. You might find yourself in Bangor, Maine. Um, you might find yourself in Scottsdale, Arizona, doing the work you love. It just, it starts with letting go of assumptions that you probably haven't examined in a long time. Now, any other critical considerations that you would recommend in order to create the momentum that, say, a, um, a journalist, a former journalist or a current journalist like you may be looking for? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's some practical stuff is like, I think there's nothing wrong with spending a year just talking to other people who've made the leap and, and really asking yourself, you know, could I be comfortable letting go of some of the preconceived notions I have? Some people just can't imagine not having that brand. I, I remember once uh, reading an interview where a, a New York Times reporter said, you know, on the first day of your job at the New York Times, you are told under no uncertain circumstances, don't forget your middle name. Your middle name is the New York Times reporter, right? So like I'm, you know, John, you know, reporter from the New York Times Smith, right? If you can't imagine living without that, that calling card, just can't let it go. You know, you work at CNN or the New York Times. If you're a public relations person and you work at, you know, you're the Edelman or the Hill and Milton, or, you know, you're a, you're a, an engineer working at, at, at you know, a giant software company, a Google or a G, where, wherever it is. Um, but I certainly think this applies to journalists. 
um, the most is if you can't let that go, if that is just so central to your identity that it, it just it means more to you than than money, than life experiences, than the relationship you have with your family, and so on and so forth, uh, this may not be the right choice for you. You might be a well and truly a lifer in the media. That's great. So to close, and knowing what you know now, what advice would you tell your younger self? One, ask yourself, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail, right? If you absolutely knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? So many of us assume we'll fail and we worry terribly that we will fail. And even as we're working as hard as we can, and we make some funny choices. We often make choices. It's like, you know what? I don't really want to do this job, but uh, you know, this will keep me out of the, this will keep me out of the gutter. It'll keep, you know, this will, this will, I'm, I'm terribly afraid I'm failing or that I'm doomed to fail. And so instead, I'm going to go take this easier job or this less lucrative job or this lower risk thing, because I'm pretty sure that I'll, I'll play a minor role there, but at least I won't be in any position to mess myself up. So ask yourself, what would you do if you knew, like you had been like a, a, you know, some magical being had promised you, you will not fail. You will not fail if you do this thing. Two is recognize that it is a marathon. You do not need to make all the big decisions this year. You know, you, there's nothing wrong. This is, I know it sort of goes against the grain of what I just said, but I would say if you are like, you know what, I'm going to spend a couple, three years here just learning how this works. Um, and so I'm going to go, I'm going to go take this job in this, this little newsroom at this community newspaper, um, because I actually think that I could learn a thing or two. That is not the same as giving up on yourself, you know, deciding, I think my, when I was 22, I kind of wanted to write, write it, write the first, you know, a great American novel. Right. But I decided, you know, let me go spend some time learning about writing and learning about life and see if I could maybe write that novel a little later. That was not a bad decision. You know, it was, it was, yes, it looked a little like the guy who's like afraid he's going to fail at writing the novel. And, 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 you know, I'm going to let, I'll let the fates argue about that, but like, it, it's not a bad thing on the other side of the coin to say, I'm going to, let me take some time because after all you can start, you can always, you know, do that bolder thing. That's more authentic to you. You can always do that. Eventually just make sure to do it eventually because you, you're going to feel great about it. Um, and, and don't, maybe don't wait quite so long. You know, I, I probably could have started this sooner. I mean, I, whatever. I mean, but yeah, the two big ones are, what would you do if you couldn't, if you knew you couldn't fail and then, recognize, hey, it's a long run. I don't need to make it all, do, do it all today. I could actually pace myself a bit and, and maybe get more out of this and get more out of life. And I think I'd add to what you just said as part of that, take the risks, be okay with taking that risks as part of your marathon. Oh yeah, I, that's such a, I mean, I, I, I was crazy to do what I did in 2011. On paper, it looked totally foolish, giving up a great job at one of the best, best media, business media company out there, in my view, and, you know, give up a good job working with people I actually like, <laughs> making, making a perfectly respectable living um, to, to go off and start from zero. Uh, but it's turned out to be one of the most gratifying things. And yeah, it definitely supports the notion that, you know, take a risk, just make sure you're taking, you know, definitely do it. Um, maybe do it multiple times in life. Um, because they, they will pay off and, and, um, um, it may not go exactly as planned, but, uh, for, for the vast majority of us, actually, I think that we do risks usually pay off. And finally, what's the best way listeners can connect with you? I mean, a great way to reach out to me is just, uh, we're still a small enough company. It's, it's not that tough to just give me a, a quick email, uh, at Stefan at Fitch Inc dot com that's ink with a k the stuff that messes up your pocket um not the uh not the corporation or or just yeah give me a call um you know 312-772-5893 that's uh that's my number um i I really don't mind if people uh you know reach out to me that way if somebody wanted to learn more probably the email best way to go name spelling is a little funny uh stefan is s-t-e-p-h-a-n-e at fitchink.com. 
Thanks so much for being on the show today. Loved that you were able to share your really compelling journey and story and and give us some great insights into the way that you've been able to build a pretty compelling content business. Oh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be uh, answering questions instead of asking them. We all want to be able to do our best work. Yet many of us have been conditioned to think that to be productive and prosperous, we need to be employed by a prestigious institution, showcasing our badge and doing our work in a big corporate office that is likely in a major city. But as Stefan advises, people need to let go of that perception. It's about being in a safe place where we can be our authentic selves. So our work is a reflection of our true capabilities. As the journalism industry is already experiencing, companies that encourage remote work may find an uptake in creativity and efficiency. So as an individual, it's important to know thyself, understand what your values and goals are, and put yourself in a location and role that makes you feel the most genuine. That might require risk-taking, so pace yourself. And understand that finding this place may take time. But the more you prioritize authenticity, the better you and your work will be in the long run. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. You can connect with Stefan at stefan at fitchinc.com. That's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-E at F-I-T-C-H-I-N-K dot com. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, leave us a review. This is what helps others find the podcast. To hear previous episodes or get show notes from this episode, you can visit us at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. And don't forget to give us a like on our new Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.